My name is A.D. Lewis. I'm the Director of Public Policy and Legislative Affairs at the Civilian Office of Police Accountability. Um, COPA, that's what we call ourselves, COPA was designed and made possible by an ordinance that was passed October 5th of 2016. Um, it was in response to a number of things that had happened, most notably um, the city releasing a video of Officer Jason Van Dyke shooting Laquan McDonald 16 times, and the community engagement and organizing that happened in the wake of that incident. Um, COPA, um, COPA's ordinance does a number of things. So one, it created COPA. Two, it abolished the independent police authority. And three, it created the public safety deputy within the Office of Inspector General for the city of Chicago. Tonight, we're going to be talking about COPA a lot. And so I want to talk about what COPA is, what COPA does, and some of our data and transparency initiatives. Um, but I would also ask you to visit chicagocopa.org for um, if you have any other questions or things like that. But also, we're going to have a Q&A afterwards. So what COPA does, first and foremost, we intake all complaints and compliments involving Chicago police officers. We also get notified of certain things that happen. So we get complaints and we also get notifications. So of those complaints, we retain specific types for our investigation, and then we refer certain other types of complaints to the uh, department's internal Bureau of Internal Affairs. Uh, it's important to note now that we are not within the police department. We're an independent city of Chicago agency, so we don't report to the superintendent of police. Um, we report to the city council. Um, we also have an independent budget floor. We also have the independence to engage with uh, uh, our own legal um, experts and don't have to go through the, department, th through the city's department of law. Okay, so of the complaints that we get, we uh, retain complaints that are specific to abuses of authority. So these are things like allegations of excessive force, coercion, which is the threat of violence, verbal abuse, which includes uh, racial bias as well as identity-based bias, as well as sexual harassment. Um, we also retain allegations involving domestic violence, whether an officer is involved in domestic violence or whether the complaint is about the officer's response to a domestic violence issue. We also investigate Fourth Amendment claims, so unlawful or unconstitutional searches or seizures, or um, unlawful denials of counsel when someone's in police custody. We also investigate certain types of incidents. So by state law, we, inv we investigate every officer-involved death. By ordinance, we investigate every officer-involved firearm discharge, whether or not that firearm discharge strikes an individual. We also look into any incident that results in a great bodily harm to a civilian. Are there any questions right now at the jump about our jurisdiction, our setup, or how we're independent from the police department? Great. Okay. So our mission, this is actually in our ordinance. So our mission, we do four things. One, we provide a just and efficient means to conduct fair and timely investigations. Two, we make determinations about those cases. Three, we identify patterns. We identify and address patterns of police misconduct. And four, we make recommendations to the Chicago Police Department. So our recommendations span a number of things. So on our investigations, those recommendations can be disciplinary. They can be about training and education. They can be about what the findings are for that specific officer and what we want that officer, um, officer's discipline to be. They can also be about the Chicago Police Department's training, their policies and procedures, their practices. Um, and it can also be about their collective bargaining agreements that their members are um, under. So our recommendations are quite vast and broad, and they don't have to be about any one specific investigation, but all of our work derives its powers from the investigation that we do into those complaints and into those incidents. So the two data things we're going to be talking about tonight, I'm going to be talking about our dashboards. And so these are our data dashboards. They're at chicagocopa.org. And this is just some screenshots. Martin's going to go to the link. What these do is th these provide people who can't necessarily download our data and make beautiful visualizations, maybe do a pivot table, it's for folks who necessarily can't do that. So we want to make it really accessible and easy to use. So let's walk them through complaint intake. So these are about our performance metrics. So up here we have the landing page, so we pull out some things that we think are important to talk about, but then we provide historical data. So we go back anywhere from t uh, seven, eight years to um, one year in our data. And so it's a number of performance metrics. This is a really easy tool for folks to use to see how we're doing. How many cases do we have? How many cases are we closing? Um, what does our intake look like? What does it look like by district? And those types of questions. Also, it's important to know, Martin, go back up a little bit. Um, scroll over that graph real quick. 
So it also provides down to that level of detail, right? So it's not just saying this is a pretty graph, but also has the numbers and data behind it. Same thing for any of the graphs. You can click on it, it'll give you more information about what that is. We have similar information for pending cases as well as cases that we've closed. So this is a really easy tool to get a quick snapshot about COPA's individual performance metrics. This allows you to see what we're doing, how we're doing it, what our findings are. Let's go to um, closed investigations. So this shows you how many investigations we've closed, and it also tells you what our findings are. So for folks who are reporters in the room, y'all are no strangers to reporting about our findings and how we, um, and how we come to conclusions in cases and those types of things. But the important thing is if you keep on scrolling, um, well, they're all important. But one of the things I find most interesting is this one right here. So we're talking about what's the age of closed cases. So you can do month, year to date, and past 12 months. You can also scroll down to closed inv investigations with findings by primary category. So what are our findings by um, the types of cases that we're closing? So this allows us to produce a lot more information than what we produce in our quarterly reports and annual reports, for example. So this allows you to get really into the data and figuring out, OK, so what does this look like? What questions does this bring up? How am I, I want to research this further in the future? Right. So this is just an entry point into the work. It's not the final product, but it's the entry point for people. So it gets people into our data, playing with our information, and it gets them more familiar with what we do and how we do it. So this is one aspect of our data transparency efforts. The next aspect is the data portal. Just, I'm going to hand it over to Martin. How's everyone doing? Yeah. All right, so first, before I get into the data, I do wanted to mention we have Anna and Dan from COPA who are sitting over here. They're our master data gurus uh, for COPA. But I also wanted to say that um, the point where we are right now in terms of the data portal um, that we're using City of Chicago, it's been months, and I wanted to give a special thanks to Tom and John who are down there in the back. Guys, who knows Tom Shank? So a special thing. I think they deserve an applause because we've been working with the with Tom and John for the last I don't know a few months. Um, it's not been easy. Uh, so this is our first time of um, having data out there for the public and being more transparent, which is one of the visions for COPA. So I, as AD mentioned, I would recommend everyone in the room to go and check our ChicagoCopa.org website. There's tons of information. And today, I'm here just to kind of present high level what our data portal and our data sets um, are for COPA. Um, as I mentioned, we've been um, active for the last maybe two weeks now? Two months. Or the, the data? For the data, or the data two sets. Weeks. Two weeks. So it's fairly new, so this is good timing that we're here, too. So with that in mind, um, everyone's familiar. I'm sorry, can you go back to that one? Um, you know, we're using the City of Chicago data portal. Um, again, if you haven't been there, go out there. There's tons of other data for other departments, not just COPA. So uh, I encourage you guys to check that out and provide any feedback. Um, so in terms of the data sets that we have out there, there's data going back to 27, uh, 2007. Um, COPA has been around since September. We went, we launched our go live date September 15. 15. Yeah. So it's only been a few weeks, but it's been months of work to get to this uh, point where COPA has uh, now a new agency. Um, information on our data sets includes um, date, ID, uh, category, status, and finding. A lot of this information will be high level, obviously, because uh, some of these uh, investigations are still pending or ongoing. So we have uh, certain data that you know, would not be open to the public. Um, there's three sets of data out there, data sets. So I'll go through them um, shortly right now. Um, we update this data weekly. Um, you know, we'll, we'll work on, you know, as we start uh, continue maturing, we'll probably do it more often, but again, um, Initially, it's weekly right now. Um, and it also includes pending cases as well. Um, so this is the, when you go to the Chicago, um, uh, City of Chicago data portal, um, you could easily search by um, COPA, any of the tags, or uh, police, and you'll find our, our data sets. Um, this is the landing page. Um, 
again, if you guys been to the um, city's data portal, it's very similar to other departments. Um, in one hand, you will have the Chicago Copa.org website. Um, right now, we're currently in the summary, so let me go over the summary page here. Um, every data set has a description of what it covers. I won't th read through the whole paragraph here, but um, in this case, we'll provide you a summary of all the cases. Um, if you scroll down, uh, well, I'm sorry, one feature to mention is um, in this same page, you could get to the other two data sets. The other ones would be the by complainer or subject and by involved officer. Great. Um, with the data sets, there's a description of uh, views. I'm sorry, go up. Oh, sorry. Downloads, uh, as you can see here, we got 138 views already, um, which is great. 32 downloads. Um, the tags, as I mentioned earlier, COPA, IPRA, um, you'll be able to find them. Um, each of the columns right now, there's um, 76,000 uh, K uh, rows, 19 columns for the complaint, at least for this summary table. Um, each data set has a description of what you're looking at, so any information you need, uh, just look into the description. It'll explain what the di different fields are. Okay, so we get to the actual table. Um, again, if you guys have been using the city's data portal, you could export this to Excel um, and do your own kind of slice and dice of the data. Um, there's also the tools, since we're leveraging the city of Chicago, there's also the tools where you could actually do your own dashboards, use the, t the city's dashboard, so feel free to obviously use those tools that are available. Um, really, I think the, the main thing for us is that this is the first time I think in, 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 in the history of uh, police accountability, I know there's other agencies in, uh, across the country that have done, but I believe we're probably the most, the most transparent at this point. Uh, we did check around, right, AD? And I think we're uh, out there in the top right now. Um, so it might not look like a lot of data at this point, but believe me, I think this is the first time we actually share this information over to the, to the public and we're having this meetings in here. So, <laughs> thank you. Sorry, there are a lot of passwords to try. So um, this would be the, um, the, the tables that um, you would be able to see. Yeah. Um, so again, all the fields um, based on the categories and the description would be noted in here. Um, from this point, you could you know, again, uh, either export it or use the tools provided through the data portal. Great. Um, if we could quickly go through the other two data sets. The data is very similar, just broken into different categories. So um, the other one would be by complaint or subject. So in this case, you will find information regarding uh, people that have uh, submitted complaints or the description. So um, you'll, you'll find the assignment, um, um, current state, current category, um, you know, sex, race. Um, some of those details will be provided in there. Mm -hmm. um, there's also uh, information you'll see in here for, you know, if it was, uh, if it stayed with COPA or IPRA or it went back to the CPD based on the type of case. Mm -hmm. um, and the last one is by involved officers. Again, this is another way we wanted to share the data um, with the public. Um, very similar setup, the descriptions um, and the tables would be in the same format. So I think, um, you know, again, this is, uh, the first time we done this, and it's um, you know we can we will continue maturing and growing as we learn more and as we're able to share more information. Mm -hmm. But um, I think this was a perfect timing for us to be here. Um, as I mentioned, we've been working with the city um, data portal, Tom and John, in terms of getting more information out there, and with our legal department as long as with COPA. Um, at this point, I'm going to pause and see if there's any questions regarding the data portal. Or, I'm not, sorry, the data sets. I just had a, a question about, so you mentioned that you're not part of the uh, Chicago Police Department. So how, uh, what, was, what was it, uh, they're not required to provide their data to you, right? Um, uh, like what happens if they're servers go down, how much time would it take for you to set up your process again, or how does that work? So I can't answer your second question, because I'm not, um, 
I'm like the least smart person in this room, so when you have ideas about like data stuff that we should do, please come up and talk to me because like literally the least smart person in this room. So, um, but I can't answer the first part. So in the ordinance, it guarantees that any information that is in the possession of the Chicago Police Department or any other agency that we need um, for our investigations is autom is, has to be provided to us. So we don't have to subpoena them. We don't have to request them. Actually, for many things, we, we have direct access to their servers. So we're not asking them, for example, for case reports, right? We can run, we can get those ourselves. So in many ways, we have direct access to what they have. And so for a lot of things, we can go grab it. And for the things we have to request, we do. But they have to provide it by ordinance to us. Yeah. It's, it's actually one of the strongest ordinances in the country for uh, direct access to the police department's data. <laughs> Same. <laughs> um, kind of along those lines, I'm, I'm curious if you have any impression of the accuracy and data quality of data that you receive from the police about specific allegations, uh, if there's any attempt made to verify that the data is correct uh, relative to complaints that are filed by citizens. So your question brings up a lot of interesting and I think really important questions. Um, first and foremost, this data goes back 10 years. Um, I can only talk about when I entered the civilian oversight realm in, this, in the city, which was, I think, the oldest of anyone who's currently here, which was in early 2016. So starting then, we can say, like, yes, there were policies and procedures in place. We were doing, you know, we had processes for quality assurance and stuff like that. But going back historically, to be honest, I don't know. Um, what we can say is that the queries that this data is drawing from is reflecting what's in the database. So if something got entered into the database incorrectly, then maybe that, then we may, may or may not be able to account for that. But also what's important is that this database draws in the current category. So it doesn't rely on that initial set of information that we got. It relies on the category at the time the case was closed or the current category of the case if it's a pending case. So we're not necessarily relying on that initial set of information that we get because categories can change. So we rely on like, what does the information within the investigation say about what category that investigation should be? Does that make sense, answer your question? Sort of, yeah. Uh, so uh, it's really exciting to have the data up. Uh, we've just been uh, checking it out already. Uh, so uh, in, in terms of the data set that has information on the individual officers, mm -hmm. uh, there are fields that have information about the race, sex, feet, age, and uh, years of, of, uh, on the force of police mm -hmm. officers, which is an interesting amount of detail. Uh, there isn't anything like a kind of a ID, you know, even like a scrambled ID that would identify kind of uniquely each police officer. Right. Uh, is it possible, uh, or you know, have there been considerations or discussions to have something like that? And so, you know, one would be able to assess, you know, like where are all the complaints coming from? You know, is it concentrated? You know, how's it dispersed among officers themselves? Right. So, um, I want to do one thing before I answer your question. Uh, Mia Sisak, our public information officer, just got here. Hi, Mia. Um, yeah, come up and answer with me. But so basically, <laughs> please take this burden off my shoulders. Uh, no, so um, as many of you know, there are these things called collective bargaining agreements in which represented employees bargain with the city of Chicago to have certain rights. So within the CBA, they're called CBAs. Within the CBA, um, one of the provisions is that the city cannot identify officers who are the subject of misconduct complaints unless there is a legal request for that information, such as a FOIA or such as a subpoena or something like that. So if you notice on our website even, when we have um, like the findings of our investigations, it's Officer 1, Sergeant 1, or Officer A, Lieutenant A, that type of information, because we are prohibited from identifying officers um, proactively, for example, in this data set. Um, the concept of a hash was certainly discussed and brought forth. Um, the question was basically, would that run afoul of both the lettering and the intent of that um, contract within the CBA? Given their ongoing negotiations, um, we didn't broach that. We just went forth with this data because we wanted to get it out. We really wanted to make sure that we had open data and that it was historical and that we were able to get it out as soon as possible. And that's something certainly I think that would be a great um, partnership for us to work on moving forward. Towards the stated aim of identifying patterns of police misconduct. Um, what sort of patterns stand out to date or that were surprising? 
I may want to pitch this to our data analysts, but some of the patterns that we routinely report on are, one, what's the location of the incident alleged to have occurred? So like, what's the beat of that? What's the district of that? Um, and so you can certainly see in our reports over time that there are certain districts that have a much higher number of complaints. These typically aggregate to the districts with the most officers as well as the most arrests, um, as well as a number of other factors. So when we look at patterns and practices, we can't just look at, okay, well, you know, what has the most police complaints? We have to take in a whole range of factors. Um, the other thing that we publish data on routinely is what's the, you know, when we look at like where officers are assigned to, like what their unit of assignment is, um, we also publish like what's the unit with the highest, I mean, we publish like what's the unit of assignment with the highest number of officers with complaints, right? So like what's, you know, if we're gonna look at unit of assignment as a potential way to look at complaints, um, how about we might look at that? So I think that there's certain patterns over time you can see with unit of assignment. Um, so those are two interesting things. Um, there's a lot of data and a lot of research that's incredibly fascinating with police um, misconduct complaints. The thing that I'm personally most interested in is how our data um, interact with other types of data. So when we look at it through an intersectional lens and we include public health or where schools are closed or where there are food deserts or where there might be a lack of EMS or fire ambulance response times, when we compare it with other data, that's when I start to get the most value as, as in, in terms of looking at things from a more intersectional and complete lens rather than just saying, I'm just gonna focus on policing. So I think that when I start to see the synergies and the resonances with other types of data and other measures of disparity, um, that's where I get the most excitement. But I, I can't necessarily say like, this is the most interesting thing we found. I just think those are three interesting things. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I was wondering, you, you mentioned one of the um, sort of one of the scopes of your responsibility is um, providing recommendations mm -hmm. to the CPD or, um, and it seems like that could, those could be pretty broad, but um, where, like, where, where does the teeth come in or like where, what amount of like, yeah, enforcement or like push can you really give and has, how, how much has that been tested? This person is concerned with enforcement. Um, no, I feel you, I, this is a huge thing. Um, so by our ordinance, um, we have a few powers. So one, when we provide public recommendations to the Chicago Police Department, especially around policy or training or something like that, they have 60 days to respond. So in that 60 days, when they, re when they provide the response, they can either say, we agree with you, here's our implementation strategy, you're totally right, COPA, Ugh, yes, go, great, we're gonna do it. They can also say, no, we totally disagree, and this is why we disagree. Regardless of whatever they choose to do, whether they agree or disagree, then we can have a public hearing with the um, Council on Public Safety, the Public Safety Committee. Yeah, yeah Alderman Boris chairs that. So they can call a public hearing. So it just takes three aldermen to request a public hearing and then us and the police department have to go talk about our recommendations. That is, a, I think, like a critical part of this of like what does a public accountability look like? So how do we prevent our beautiful, amazing, incredible reports from just being PDFs on our website? Right? Like that's a huge thing for us too that we're tracking. Um, I also want to just say one thing. So a hash for folks who don't understand, going back to your question about how do we identify individual officers. So a hash is when you're able to, to say, okay, well, I'm going to take this unique ID, such as an employee number, or um, it doesn't really work for star numbers in the Chicago Police Department because their star numbers change, but I'm going to take their employee ID and I'm going to hash it. So instead of saying, you know, I'm going to assign basically a one-to-one -one relationship between these two fields and not provide the employee ID, I'm going to provide you the hash number. That's what a hash is. is. Am I right, data people? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know y'all. Yes, and what so what the uh, what the hash allows you to do? Pardon my mansplaining. Um, is it allows you to say this one officer has been involved in X number of things? So it allows you to say over time this is the scope of this officer's um, allegations and investigations and this is their findings and things like that. Uh, what other cities have similar offices to COPA and how effective have those been? And the efficacy question remains. Um, I will say this, uh, the number of other cities is quite large that have civilian oversight. The number of other cities that have independent investigatory bodies with COPA's jurisdiction is zero. So we're one of the few agencies in the country who investigate shootings, for example. Um, but we're the only civilian oversight agency with our breadth of jurisdiction. Um, the most comparable offices for us are 
New York has the Civilian Complaint Review Board, or CCRB. Um, they actually have, like, they're the reason why we have dashboards. They have dashboards. Um, <laughs> we want it to be as good as New York. Um, and the other places that we look to are places like Seattle, Denver, um, Cleveland, New Orleans, Washington, D.C., and L.A. Um, there's a national organization called the National Association of Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, N-A-C-O-L-E. It's called NACOL. That's our national organization for them. But they provide a lot of information that compare the models nationally because investigations is just one model. There's also like an audit model and an investi like inspector general model. So we have a hybrid model here in Chicago. Can you talk about some of the metrics by which you define the success of COPA? Low and bliss. Okay. All right. The, uh, the question is about the metrics for success. Um, I think one of the metrics that people want to use to quantify the success for COPA is what's called the sustained rate. Both the sustained rate of cases closed with findings and the sustained rate of all cases we intake. I think that's not a great way to measure the efficacy of an organization who's supposed to do um, objective, fair investigations. Um, because the measure should be, do we follow the facts where they lie, and do we actually do good, timely investigations? Um, so we're not shooting after a sustained rate. That's not what we do. We want to close all investigations in a timely way. So I think our big metric is how quickly are we closing investigations that are fair, that are objective, and that get to the heart of the matter. Um, and so also I should mention that when COPA launched on September 15th, it inherited a substantial backlog of cases from IPRA. So one of our metrics, at least in the immediate future, is how quickly we can work through the backlog of cases um, and how quickly can we investigate those, right? But as far as like, us shooting for a specific metric of what efficacy or effectiveness looks like from a metric standpoint, I can't say it, but I will say that hopefully in a year to two to three years, we will be back here on this stage presenting about our new data transparency initiatives that we'll be doing deeper community engagement work that will continue on the path of becoming a civilian oversight agency who serves all of Chicago and becomes the national model. That's, that's our measures of effectiveness and efficacy. Um, I was wondering, so you mentioned timeliness, and I was wondering uh, what an investigation process looks like, especially in terms of um, timeline from the mm -hmm. incident, and mm -hmm. also how many people are involved in the investigation and um, that, that kind of thing. Okay, so um, ultimate cop-out answer, it depends. So, no, it really does. So, for example, a shooting, which we um, get notified of and roll out to that scene of that shooting to gather evidence, to interview folks, to start to do that uh, initial gathering of evidence right then and there, same thing with officer-involved deaths and the most serious of incidents, those cases require a level of resources that is not comparable to some other types of cases. So a shooting case or an officer-involved death case is going to get a lot of resources very immediately to get the um, time-sensitive evidence. Right? So there's specific things that if we don't get in a certain amount of time, they disappear. Um, that's true for all of our investigations as well. So if we know of something that happened yesterday, we're going to want to go out immediately and find that video, for example. But generally, investigations should take, um, by our ordinance, under six months. The goal that the city has set is that you should finish investigations within six months. That's our expectation, and if you don't, you have to tell people that you're not doing it and why. But the general investigation procedures are gathering evidence, identifying involved parties. This can be civilians who are the subject or the civilians who are witnesses, but also officers who may or may not be named in that complaint. So figuring out who the officers are who are involved, figuring out the full totality of the parties. And then once we have that, uh, like evidence, party identification, and then it becomes about interviewing and weighing the evidence. So once we've done the interviews and concluded that, we have all the evidence at our disposal, then it goes through a legal analysis, the summary, and then like the drafting of the summary report and findings, and then um, that's when the process gets extra tricky because it depends on what the finding is. So if we sustain a complaint, then that has a process after us um, as well. But that's what a general investigation looks like. We also have information on our website that spells out some more specifics. Um, you mentioned other than the, um, the complaints that are filed for um, these, these incidences, you get notifications. Mm -hmm. um, where do they come from? Where are the resources? Are those in and then also, like, how is the anonymity of the complainants? 
during the process of the investigation? How is that protected? Okay, so your first question about notifications. Um, we get notifications from two sources, but it's the, um, the Crime Prevention Information Center gets notified from the Office of Emergency Management and Communications. So the, our 911 call center tells the CPD Fusion Center and then they tell us. We can also get another communication from the 911 call center themselves. Oh, we also get notifications for specific incidents. Thank you, Mia. Um, so these are officer-involved deaths or anything that could result in an officer-involved death. For example, a major motor vehicle crash involving an officer, an incident in custody that results in a serious injury, as well as firearm discharges. And so we get calls as well as email notification blasts about those things after they occur. And then the second question, can you repeat it one more time? I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, like, during the investigation, the, the, the information that's provided by the complainants, mm -hmm. like, how is that protected in terms of keeping them in, uh, anonymous, so? What? I'm, I'm going to pass this to Mia. Okay. okay, so quickly, back to the CBAs. The officers have a Bill of Rights that was agreed to by the city, so there is at a certain point where an officer has the right to know who their accuser is. So once charges are bought, administrative charges, is this a super spot? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah I guess. Sweet spot. Um, so once administrative charges are brought against an officer um, from, from the Department of Law and the superintendent, they have a right to know who their accuser is. So there is a time in the investigative process for a while that they won't know, but once we bring them in for a statement and we're saying we're accusing you, we're charging you with these, um, According to their Bill of Rights, they, they're allowed to know who um, their accuser is. Now, there are some very strict rules and punishments against retaliation, but they do get to know at some point. Um, yeah, so I feel like with police data, a lot of it is self-reported. Even with complaints, a lot of it's all self-reported, so I'm sure there's a lot of inconsistencies. So I'm curious, like, how you go about data cleaning. Like, if there's an inconsistency, do you just take that entire report out? Or I feel like there's a lot of different, this is a very open-ended question. So a question about how do we, like what's our quality assurance or quality management process for our data? So two things, um, I'm gonna report, right, I'm gonna kind of repeat what I said earlier. So there's, um, when complaints come in, they're assigned an initial category code based on the content of the allegation at the time we receive it. So this can sometimes not include the full amount of information about what the investigation is about. Maybe we only know this much of it, but it's the, that's the whole pie, right, that we wanna learn. So during the course of the investigation, we learn more about that case and we can reassign the category code. And so that's the current category code that's currently in there. So and this isn't to say that the initial category code is necessarily wrong. What it says is that the current category code reflects the, like, the most serious allegation of that complaint at the time. Um, so for pending investigations, that current category code reflects you know, what's the best reflection of everything we know at this point. And then for closed cases, um, it should reflect what's the full totality of that case at the time it was closed. But, um, but as far as like, do we go back and scrub data? Um, did we go back to 2007 and scrub data? No. My question is for the interpretation and analysis of the data. Mm -hmm. um, what is COPA doing, or is COPA doing anything at this time to kind of protect itself from allegations of bias from the police department? So I could see someone saying, hey, you're, you're, you're analyzing the facts of this case, but you don't have the background in police training or anything like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I would say that too. But <laughs> no, um, so one of the, one of the uh, um, criticisms of the former oversight agency was the, um, the quality or the, uh, what was the expertise of the investigators. So what we, so what we do with, at COPA, they come in, they have this six week training academy. But basically, um, first of all, everyone has to have a background in, um, as an investigator before. So from like day one, you have to have a minimum of two years from an um, investigatory background. But we take them through the process. And part of their six-week training academy for COPA is going over to CPD Academy and learning the use of force. So we, they get trained on the things that the officers are trained on so that we have some insight as to how they make those decisions. Because otherwise, how are we going to make an assessment of whether or not their actions are within policy. So I hope that answers. Well, that answers part of my question. I guess the other thing I would ask about is when you have an investigation, what is the structure of the team? How are you all working together day to day? 
So one of the changes at COPA is that investigations are worked through a squad or team basis. So it's not longer it's no longer one investigator to one supervisor, and they're just working that case. It's actually a team approach, and we think this is great for a number of reasons. One, you get a vast array of experiences and opinions and expertises, and so that no one person has an undue influence on the outcomes of a case. Um, second, all of our investigatory teams are paired up with an attorney who helps them along with the legal analysis. This is especially important in excessive force cases as well as Fourth Amendment cases that kind of require a much closer legal look at what are the policy ramifications, are they weighing evidence appropriately, are we meeting our preponderance threshold, and those types of cases. So, the, I mean, things are much, like, things are framed in, in a team environment for which we rely on each other for, hey, look at this case, hey, dude, you know, look at this for us, um, let's work together to get this. Specific cases, such as shootings, officer-involved death, those types of things, those go through an uh, internal review process called a, a quality assurance review before they're finalized as well. So, and also cases are selected at random to go through that as well. So we have built-in quality um, assessment tools to help us figure out, okay, you know, before we release things, before we finalize things, what's the quality of it? Does it meet our expectations? And what can we learn from this? The short answer, there's a supervising investigator, a lead investigator, a co-investigator. They work together to do, the, to do the investigate the case and then it ladders up to a deputy chief investigator. And then if it's a, um, a major case closing, the chief administrator has to sign off on it and go through it. But like you said, an, an, an attorney is assigned to every major case from the beginning. So two um, things, one question, can you talk Special about lab. your... The, the case files you release and um, what information you release with them when you release it, videos, that kind of thing. Um, and then the second thing is, d separate from these guys, I just kind of wanted to let everyone know that there is an organization called the Coalition for Police Contracts Accountability that is working to address some of the issues these guys have been talking about. Um, not everything, they're not connected to government at all, so I just wanted to put that out there for anyone who's interested, cpcachicago.org. As far as like the system. So, um, a few things. One, if something trips the trans, so if, if something, so if there's a shooting or an officer-involved death or a major incident that's under the city's transparency policy, we release videos and reports within 60 days of that incident, unless there's been an extension. Um, and we also release those materials on, on an ongoing basis throughout the investigation. So if we come across more videos or more um, reports, those are also released. Hi. So um, you kind of talked about how there's a pretty uh, clear definition of what you consider police m misconduct and what 911 um, cases get forward to your office. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how that came about and if you, if you could talk about if, if that will be changed in the future or if you will also be considering other sources like let's say 311 or things like that. So, so yeah, so we do get um, complaint referrals from 311. Also, I mean, we get complaints through a number of resources. So people come into our office, they call our office, they make complaints via the web. We have a special link just for litigation related complaints about civil cases or something like that or criminal cases. So we get our complaint intake from a number of sources. Um, complainants, attorneys, um, CPD members themselves, journalists, um, I mean everyone. So anyone can make a complaint, um, but the notifications we get from other city agencies are about specific types of incidents. So a 311, for example, that would be a complaint um, and not a notification. But yeah, we, we, we get complaints from everywhere. We take them any way we can get them. But the notification specifically, the notification that I was for when an officer discharges his weapon or there right. is a death from an officer's action or inaction. Right. So when they get on their radios, we work together with OEMC, which is actually very helpful. When they get on their radios and say, you know, shots fired, shots fired, that notification immediately starts and then we come and we actually respond to the scene where right. officers have discharged their weapons. Okay. Great. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Give them a hand.